Hello and good morning everyone. My name is Kurt Mueller. I am your favorite patent attorney and we are here with my favorite time of the year. The time of the year when the United States Supreme Court starts to grace us with the most important decisions of the year. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, the United States Supreme Court sits from the first Monday in October to the last day of June. So that's the time frame the United States Supreme Court hears arguments and renders decisions. And as a continuing trend, they tend to put the most important decisions towards the end of the year, the most controversial ones, the most important ones towards the end of the year. Now, on a certain level, that, of course, makes sense because they want more time to be able to work through the analysis and try to persuade each other and try to try to anticipate all the arguments that might come forward and try to make the decision as good as it can be. It makes a certain sense that it would be delayed to the end of the year, but the upshot for you and I is that it's this time of the year when we start to see the most exciting cases, the most decisive cases, the ones that are going to most transform the law. And so we are starting now with three cases of note, and it's only going to get more interesting from here on, folks. So strap in, because from here until the end of June, we're going to get some really interesting cases, and we're going to try to explain to you the impact of them and how it has transformed the law. So there are three notable cases that were decided this Monday that I think would be of interest to the lawful masses audiences, so I want to cover those. This first case is McCoy versus Louisiana. What is the background of this case? Well, McCoy was convicted and sentenced to the death penalty. So not the greatest upstanding citizen in the world. The way that his trial came to be, though, is what makes the United States Supreme Court get interested. He was extremely insistent at every possible stage of the trial and sentencing that he did not, in fact, commit the crime. His lawyer did not, however, believe him. His lawyer believed that the evidence against his defendant uh, was absolutely overwhelming, that he was proven guilty eight different ways, and that this guy was not telling the truth. So his lawyer made a decision, a, t a tactical de decision during trial. And what he basically said is, okay, I'm this guy's lawyer. My objective is to try to get this guy the best possible result. You know, I am trying to get this guy the best possible result. Obviously, from my point of view as the defense lawyer, him being acquitted would be the best possible result. That's not going to happen. I can't make that happen. There's just too much evidence against this guy. There, there's no way this guy is not getting acquitted. So what's the next best possible result? Well, the next best possible result would be life imprisonment rather than death penalty. And so his lawyer makes a decision and says, the only way I can see to get there, in essence, is by confessing guilt. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, you know, my guy is guilty, but, you know, that he has these mental issues, that he has these other issues, and essentially plead for mercy. I'm going to appeal to the jury's humanity. I'm going to appeal to their good nature and their grace. And I'm going to say this guy's guilty in the hope of getting uh, hope of getting mercy. And, and I'm doing that because it's the only way for me to get credibility with this, with this jury. If I'm absolutely insistent, as my defendant is, that the defendant did not commit the crime, I'm just going to lose all credibility. The jury is not going to believe a word that I say. I need them to believe me. I need them to have credibility in me. I need them to have trust in me. So I'm going to confess what I perceive to be the obvious, say that my defendant is guilty, and from that, gain the credibility I need in order to make sure that my guy gets the best possible result in this situation, which is life imprisonment. Well, the fact that this is a capital case should tell you that that strategy did not, in fact, work. The guy was sentenced to death by the Louisiana jury, and this case comes to appeal on the assistance to counsel claim, the Sixth Amendment claim. So the question the United States Supreme Court has to answer and did answer is, did his lawyer fail to give him effective assistance of counsel, which is the Sixth Amendment right. Did his lawyer do something fundamentally wrong that renders a constitutional violation? The United States Supreme Court answers that question today in the affirmative. His lawyer did, in fact, make a mistake that goes to a constitutional violation. So we're going to read the syllabus, which is the summary prepared by the clerks of court, and, and say what it says. It says here at the bottom, 
held the Sixth Amendment guarantees a defendant the right to choose the objective of his defense and to insist that his counsel refrain from admitting guilt, even when counsel's experience-based view is that confessing guilt offers defendant the best chance to avoid the death penalty. The Sixth Amendment guarantees each criminal defendant the assistance of counsel for his defense. The defendant does not surrender control entirely to counsel for the Sixth Amendment, and granting to the accused personally the right to make his defense speaks of assistance of counsel. An assistant, however expert, is still assistant. The lawyer provides, the lawyer's providence is trial management, but some decisions are reserved for the client, including whether to plead guilty, waive the right to a jury trial, testify on one's behalf, and forego appeal. Autonomy to decide the objective of the defense to assert innocence belongs in this reserved for the client guilty. Refusing to plead guilty in the face of overwhelming evidence against her, rejecting the assistance of counsel, and insisting on maintaining her innocence at the guilt phase of the capital trial are not strategic choices. They are decisions about what the defendant's objectives in, in fact are. So this is really interesting and goes to a classic dichotomy in the relationship between a lawyer and an attorney. The client sets the objective. The lawyer sets the methodology to get there. So a lawyer can make decisions like what witnesses to call, what evidence to present, what questions to ask, and those kinds of things. Those are strategic, tactical decisions, and they come with, come with trade-offs you know, uh, that, that are too complicated to lay out in, in, a simple, in a simple way. But every case unfolds in its own way, and a lawyer has to make judgment calls. It's like, ooh, do I call this witness? Do I ask that question? Do I present this evidence? What are the potential implications? How's the jury going to do that? How should I do things? So there's a whole bunch of decisions a lawyer gets to make. But fundamentally, what this case says is the, that the client gets to make certain structural, strategic, objective calls. The, the client sets the objective, and one of the things that the client alone gets to make the decision on is whether or not to plead guilty. And that includes not just the literal plea of guilty, but also the confession of guilt. As the Supreme Court went on to decide in this case, some defendants that will make the decision that whatever hope they might have, as, as thin as it might be, for acquittal m might be more important than avoiding the death penalty. And that's a decision someone has to make for themselves. I mean, who, who am I, who are you to say they should prefer one or the other is basically the United States Supreme Court's call. The Supreme Court is also very clear that the lawyer has every right and obligation, in fact, to tell his client all the things that he thinks. He should tell his client, you should do this. This is the best hope you have. Here's all my advice. Here's why it's the best decision. But fundamentally, it is for the client, not the lawyer, to make this decision. This was considered a structural error. And so the United States Supreme Court has reversed this conviction. It will go back down for a trial, a new trial from square one, and where he can assert his, or she can assert her innocence, and we'll go from there. Now, whether or not she will be successful, who knows? I mean, the evidence suggests strongly no, but she's entitled to make that decision regardless of the outcome. This is a structural error, and that's what the United States Supreme Court decided here, and I think that's very interesting. Our second case of note is Byrd versus United States. Now, this case is pretty interesting. What happened here is that Byrd wanted to rent a car, but other, except rather than just rent the car himself, for reasons, he had a friend go rent the car for him. So his friend, Reed, went to the car rental place, signed the rental form, and literally walked out of the rental place and handed the, the keys to the friend, Bird. Now, why they did that is not clear on the record, nor does it really matter. But the reasons is probably because Bird suspected that for whatever reason that he was not going to be eligible for the car. Now, Bird was not just merely um, being a little deceptive with uh, his rental of the car. He's being a little deceptive just in general because, as you can see here, uh, when he was pulled over by the police and his car was searched, they found body armor and 49 bricks of heroin. So, <laughs> Bird was not exactly, again, the most upstanding citizen, but again, hey, 
This is the United States Supreme Court. A lot of cases come with not upstanding citizens. So this guy has 49 bricks of heroin, not 50. I guess he was one short. And uh, he was using a rental car, perhaps to evade the police or whatever. But the police pulled him over. They searched his car. They found the heroin. And so there was a question as to as to whether or not the search was proper. Now, there there's a lot of circumstances in which the search can or cannot be proper. But the particularized question was in this particular circumstance, whether Byrd could raise an objection to the search at all, whether he could in the first instance say at all that there might be a problem, whether he, he had what's considered standing to even raise the question. The lower courts actually said no, that he didn't have standing to raise the question. He couldn't even ask the question as to why the search was proper. Now, why couldn't he do that? Well, the court said because he wasn't in, in, in just possession of the car. Remember, it wasn't his car. It wasn't even his rental car. It was someone's car that someone rented on his behalf. And this rental agreement, like many rental agreements, said in all capital letters, as it ha turned out, that you could not give the car to another party to drive. So you could not, unless the name was on the rental form, you could not turn the keys over to someone else. That was a contractual violation. And the contract said that if you did that, the contract could become void. So it could, it could completely destroy the contract. The only people authorized to drive this car, as far as the rental car company were concerned, were the people who were authorized on the form and Bird was not on the form. So the police and government took the position that he was not in, in just possession of the car. And because of that, he did not have the authorization to even raise the complaint. Now, if you think that this is completely silly, let me point out a, a slightly different hypothetical that the courts have, have pretty unanimously said doesn't raise a problem. Let's suppose that for some reason, the police come to your home and they, they, they search your home and someone at the home objects. But in the particularized instance, the person that is objecting is in fact a burglar. He is just a thief who has broken into your home to steal stuff and the police conduct a search. Your, your robber objects to a search and, and, and some evidence is found that helps to convict him. Now, can you, the house owner, object to the search? Yes, you can. You have a privacy interest in the house. You have a right to your expectation of privacy. You have a Fourth Amendment interest. So you can object if the police come after you you could raise the issue, but can your, can your robber raise an objection? No, no, he can't. He has absolutely no lawful interest in where he is. He has no lawful interest in the possession. And if he, same analysis, if he decides to steal your car, if the police search the car, can you object? Yes. Can he object? No, because he's, he has no lawful right to be there. He has no standing. So the question was, is Bird in a similar possession, position? Is he just like a thief who has no right to raise a question at all because of his illegal activities, or is it something different than that? Well, the United States Supreme Court has answered that question, and the answer to the question they gave is that Bird's possession of the car appears to have been otherwise lawful. You know, let's put aside the contractual breach for a second. Maybe there is a breach of contract, maybe not. But merely a breach of contract, the Supreme Court says, is a civil violation. This is potentially a civil violation, right? If I break a contract with you, that's a civil wrong, and you and I would have a civil dispute that could be resolved in a civil court. But a criminal court, you know, my breach of contract does not suddenly become a criminal violation. So, Bird's possession of the car, the United States Supreme Court has decided, appears to raise the issue that this is just a lawful use, even, un even, un even if unauthorized. And because of that, Bird can raise the objection in the first instance. Now, Bird's not off scot-free. This case is going to go back down to trial for a couple decisions. First of all, some states actually make this kind of rental car um, shell game a literal crime by state law. So in some states, it is literally illegal, not just a contract violation, but the law literally says that if you sign a contract for a rental car and you hand over the keys to someone else, that makes it a literal crime. So the question is, 
which is unsolved by this case, is does that kind of crime raise the same issues as the thief that breaks into the house? I mean, is it is it that same tier of crime? Does it matter what the classification of the crime is in the state? Does it matter if that offense is a misdemeanor or a felony? Does it matter the class of class of crime? The answer to that question is unsolved. It's unsolved here. And this will be a question that will have to come up in later cases. What do you do in, cir in circumstances where by state law, it has been made an actual crime as it has in some states? The second issue is even if Byrd has the standing to raise the objection in the first instance, as the Supreme Court says he does, maybe the police can, can still be justified in the search. And just because you say you don't want your car to be searched doesn't mean that you have the right to say no. The, the police may have the right to um, search your car, notwithstanding the fact that you object. Um, of course, consent always wins. So my recommendation and most lawyers recommendation is you shouldn't say yes when the police say, can I search your car? Just, just, just say no. If they can search your car anyway, well, okay, they can search your car anyway. You know, don't, don't interfere with them if they try, but don't say yes. You know, if they, if you consent, that's like the end of the ball game. So this is not the end of the ball game, but it's not the start of the ball game either uh, to, to malform the analogy. You know, the police may have other lawful basis to search the car. And there's about 30 cases of note that, that decide when the police can and cannot search a car. So the, the argument from the government is going to be, well, they still have the right to search the car, uh, notwithstanding the refusal because of probable cause or reasonable suspicion or some other, some other element. Um, and that will have to be uh, re-adjudicated at the trial court stage. My suspicion is that the uh, United States will, at the end of the day, be able to get their evidence in under an alternate theory. But the theory that they tried to get in on, in on was that Byrd couldn't even raise the objection at all. The, the United States Supreme Court says that's wrong. He can raise the objection. Now that he can raise the objection, well, let's see whether or not that objection works. Probably not, but hey, he gets to try. So back to trial for you. We'll see how it goes out from here. And case number three, which I think is the most entertaining of the three, is Murphy versus National Collegiate Athletic Association. So this deals with gambling and sports gambling in the United States. So the upshot is uh, to get to the punchline is that your ability to bet on sports is coming to a casino near you in the near future. Um, United States law on gambling has always been tricky, as the United States Supreme Court points out. This has been something that we as a country have struggled with. Our attitudes towards gambling have, have shifted both to and from at various points in, in history. And so our relationship with gambling is, is very strange. Um, so our present before this case was uh, decided, there was a law in the United States that the Pref Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act, which, which basically said in substance that no state could authorize sports gambling at, at a casino is basically what it said to be short about it. Now, it did provide an exception for any state that had sports gambling at that time in that state. So Nevada, of course, and Las Vegas is very famous for sports book betting. You can walk into a Nevada casino today and lay down a bet on the result of a sports game. No problem, because Nevada had this in place before the federal law came into place. And so the federal government gave them a carve out. Now, they also said that New Jersey could have done this if they did it within a year, but they didn't do it within that year. In fact, they took about 20 years. And New Jersey decided, hey, you know, um, people aren't coming to Atlantic City as much as they used to. Uh, we'd like uh, people to come to Atlantic City more. And we think that if we had people have the ability to bet on the results of sports games, uh, football games, basketball games, that would be really nice. So we'd like to have it legal in New Jersey for you to lay a bet on a sports game. Well, the federal government objected. The federal government said, no, we have a law that says you, you can't do that. You cannot authorize sportsbook betting. So this went on for a long time. This was up and down the courts 
for several different times, the state legislature got involved at least twice, passing different kinds of laws. I mean, it was a huge mess up and down the court system where they, where the New Jersey, New Jersey legislature tried to do something. They got whacked by a court of appeals. They tried to do something else. They got whacked by a court of appeals. This went on for quite a while. And so their, their latest attempt was, as all the previous attempts were, an attempt to satisfy all the decisions of the lower courts before them. But still, the courts were not having any part of it. They said, no, what you're trying to do is authorize something that you're not able to authorize. But this time, what was different is the United States Supreme Court decided to get involved. And they got involved with a question that basically boils down to what authority does the federal government have? at all with respect to what they can order and what they can't order. And the basic upshot of, of this is that the federal government, as a general proposition, this gets complicated, but as a general proposition, the federal government can pass laws that impact individuals, but they cannot pass laws that impact states. We have this thing in America called federalism, which is very complicated because Basically, what it means is that we have a dual sovereignty. In most countries, if you want to know who is the sovereign, well, that's pretty easy. It's the, it's the national government. Um, it's, the, it's the federal government. So it's just the, the nation of X is the, is the sovereign entity. In the United States, asking that question, um, it's a little bit more complicated than that because the answer is both the state and the federal government. If you want to ask, like, is the state of New Jersey sovereign or is the United States sovereign? The answer is yes. <laughs> they are both sovereign. They are both sovereign. And this obviously is unbelievably complicated. And if you think that this is confusing and makes no sense, well, welcome to the last 200 plus years of constitutional law, because this has been a major point of struggling uh, between the, uh, the states and the federal government. In fact, you could argue in no small part that this tension was due to the was uh, ultimately the, the major reason for the U.S. Civil War. Uh, who gets to decide is a major issue. And the whole state's rights issue is not trivial. States obviously have rights to do something. What they have the right to do and what the federal government has the right to do, massively complicated. So if you're interested in this subject, you can go look up federalism and uh, welcome to the rabbit hole because it gets pretty deep. Um, but here the, the, here the answer is to boil it down is that the this particular law was unconstitutional because it was unconstitutionally commandeering. It was the federal government trying to hijack or control the apparatuses of the state government or the state police. So if the federal government wants to have a law, any law, they themselves can do it. They themselves can enforce it. What they cannot do, and this has been decided in previous cases and emphasized here again, what they cannot do is hijack a state government. So for example, the prohibition against marijuana. Can the federal government have a law that prohibits marijuana? Well, so far, the answer to that question is yes. Well, how can they enforce it? Well, they, they can get their own police. They themselves can enforce it if they want. But can they order a state police force to go and enforce their law for them? No, they can't. They can't do that. They cannot order a state government or a state police officer to do what they to do their work for them. If they the United States Supreme Court is clear, hey, federal government, if you want to do this, go do it yourselves. Go do it yourselves. You, the state government is not your puppet. They are not a they're not your thing to control. You do not get to control the state legislature. You do not get to control the state police. They are not yours. You have your own legislature. You can have your own police. You know, go nuts but you cannot directly order estates to do something on your behalf. That's called commandeering, and it is unconstitutional as previously decided and as reemphasized here. So the improper thing was that the, the law said to the state legislatures, you cannot authorize something. You can't pass a law that authorizes something in your state. And actually you can't repeal something that makes it illegal because that was the case in New Jersey. There was a law that affirmatively said that this was illegal. And what New Jersey wanted to do was repeal the law. Well, the, the United States argued 
And uh, the Supreme Court agreed that that kind of repeal is actually an authorization because it was banned and now it's no longer banned. So the Supreme Court says, yeah, that's an authorization. We, we can't differentiate that from uh, an authorization. So merely saying this is no longer illegal, that counts as an authorization. We're comfortable with that. But because we're comfortable with that, that's a decision New Jersey gets to make, period. You know, they get to make that for themselves. If you want to have sports book betting be illegal, if you want this to really be illegal, you can go do it. You can pass a law. You can enforce it. But you cannot make New, Jer New Jersey do your dirty work. And that is the upshot of this case. So New Jersey is going to, in the extremely near future, as in like by this fall, have sports book betting legal in in Atlantic City, and you can be very confident indeed that it's coming to other places in this country in the very near future because the tax the tax revenue from the gambling is just too attractive. It has been it's been said that there's five billion dollars of legal sports book betting in the United States right now, and a hundred billion dollars of illegal sports book betting. So. New Jersey and every other state is very interested in getting a piece of that revenue, and now they have the ability to do so. Now, of course, not every state has to. This is a decision states get to make. So some states will not do this, just as some states don't have gambling, they don't have casinos. You don't have to have casinos, you don't have to have gambling, you don't have to do anything. It's a decision you get to make. New Jersey wants to do it, New Jersey's going to do it, and I'm pretty confident it's coming to other states as well. So those are the three major decisions of note that came out this Monday. I hope that this was helpful as an overview of the change in the law and uh, helps to explain some of the background and theory behind these cases so that uh, we're all a little bit better able to understand what's going on. So I'll leave it off there. For now, I am Kurt Mueller. I am your favorite patent attorney. And this has been the first of a series of overviews of major Supreme Court cases that will be decided this term. Stay tuned for more. It's going to get interesting from here, guys. All right, later. Ciao.